Well, good welcome, welcome to St. Mary's for our Palm Sunday service, and uh, thank you, fantastic. Uh, a very warm welcome, especially if you're visiting us, and uh, it's uh, a beautiful day outside, a little fresh, but spring has sprung, and uh, we have a very early Easter this year, uh, but Palm Sunday is today, and John Salkel, one of our lay preachers, is going to be preaching later for us, and we've got our children's groups as well. So today is the day we remember that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And I wonder if anyone can tell me where in the building that is uh, sort of visualized for us. So, where, yes, don't it? Up there. Up there, yes, that's right, up there. Lowered. Lowered, it's there. And then uh, there are the gates of Jerusalem a bit further up there on our sort of Holy Week sort of, um, it's not quite a tapestry, a painting. And uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that painting of, of Holy Week, all the events of Holy Week, but it, it focuses on Jesus on Monday, Thursday in Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane, and not the cross. I have to get my head around that. Why did the artist do that? But we'll be focusing on the cross uh, through uh, our Good Friday events, which we'll tell you a bit about later. So today is the day when we remember that Jesus is the king of not just Israel, of not just of the Jewish people, but of the, the whole world, in fact, of the whole universe. And so he's worthy of our praise. There's no one else that's worthy of our praise and devotion. So as we begin, let me just uh, say a prayer as we begin our time together. Gracious God, as we remember this day, how Jesus entered Jerusalem to cries of celebration, help us, help us to welcome him afresh into our hearts and lives. Accept the praise and worship we bring you and give us a real sense of expectation as we look forwards to the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hosanna to the Son of David. Glory in the highest heaven. Amen. So that would be appropriate to uh, sing our first song about praise. Praise is rising. And as we do that, if you haven't received a cross, a Palm Sunday cross, I wonder if um, our welcome team could uh, just um, uh, hand those around during our first hymn. So let's stand and sing this uh, song together.
face of the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see Let's just stay standing, and we've got a confession to say together. It's a Palm Sunday confession, but let us uh, just reflect on this together. Let's come up on the screen. We'll say all the words of the confession together. Jesus, we have sinned in what we have thought. Cross out selfish ideas and fill us instead with your love of seeing the best in others. I, sorry, I, that's, there's a, sorry, just go back a bit. I forgot to do something with your palm crosses. With this confession, you're meant to do various things with this confession. Uh, and the first one was to put it over your head. So that's what we do. Now we're moving towards our lips. So have this cross over our lips. So put it back on. Uh, Jesus, we have sinned with what we have said. Cross out our hurtful words and fill us instead with your concern to speak blessing into others' lives. And then with our hands. Jesus, we've sinned in what we have done. Cross out the evil we do and instead make us channels of your peace and love. Next one. And also in our minds. Jesus, we've confessed what we've come to our minds. By your word and your spirit, peace our hearts and help us to see deeper into our condition so that we can be further healed. Jesus, we thank you for your promise to forgive all who repent and believe your good news. Amen. Amen. Well, I thought that was a complete success, but there we are. Let me just pray. Father God, we do thank you that uh, through the cross of Christ, all our sins are forgiven. And as we enter into the events of Holy Week and we begin today with Palm Sunday. Help us to renew our faith and trust in you. And may all that you did for us be renewed and refreshed in our lives so that our faith is deepened and our, our joy is strengthened and our hope of resurrection and eternal life is renewed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, there's a, they sang Hosanna, and we're going to sing uh, a wonderful children's song called We're Going to Celebrate, and you might want to wave your palm branches as we sing this together. Let's sing.
wonderful. It's good, isn't it, just to be the crowd, like the crowd were on that first Palm Sunday. Well, our children are going to go out in a moment. They're going to go to their groups uh, for everyone years one to eight, six, you see year six for our kids and Pathfinders are year seven to years nine. And then uh, we have Bridge as well. And we've got uh, things to remind you of, children, as you go out. There's Easter experience on uh, Friday and then the Easter fun on Saturday as well. Things to, uh, there were some slides for that, but we'll put those up later. Okay. Let me pray for, for our children as they go to their groups. Loving Heavenly Father, would you please fill all of us with that Palm Sunday joy. And as you came to draw all people to yourself, please draw us closer to you today, however old we are. In Jesus' name, amen. So children, if you'd like to go to your groups and adults, just take a moment just to say hi to those around you. And... Uh, what you're looking forward to doing over Easter, perhaps. To, we're going to uh, before Andy's keen he wants to give us our New Testament we're going to have a we're going to have an Old Testament reading now it's not on your uh, sheets but we're going to look together at Psalm 118 and you can find it on page 617 in the church Bibles 617 and we're going to just read the second half of the psalm because you think, well, why is it that they use some of those uh, words for praising, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord? Why did they use those words? Well, they were words that come from this psalm. And they were words that were used. This psalm was used to greet the king of Israel coming into Jerusalem and coming through the gates of the city up to the temple. And so it's just to remind ourselves of that. And it's good to read the Psalms together from time to time. So we're going to read together from Psalm 118, from verses 19 down to the end, 29. So if you want to join me with that, that's, that would be great. Beginning at verse 19. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. 
The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he made us light to shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And then on your sheets, there's the colic. Let's say this together. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we're going to have now our New Testament reading from John's Gospel. Andy. The New Testament reading is taken from John's Gospel and may be found on page 1079 in your Bibles. John chapter 12, reading from verses 12 to 36, page 1079. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. 
we have heard from the Lord that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must, must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you, while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Shall we pray before we start? Heavenly Father, please give us minds to understand and hearts to respond to your message today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I heard a story recently about three prisoners who were due to go before a firing squad. And at dawn, when the time came, the first prisoner was put up against a wall and the, prisoner, and, the, and the firing squad lined up to shoot. And the prisoner was desperate to come up with a strategy to get out of this predicament. And suddenly a moment of inspiration came to him. The officer in charge of the firing squad shouted, ready, aim. And suddenly the prisoner shouted out in a loud voice, earthquake. And everyone ran round in confusion, looking for the earthquake, and meantime the prisoner ran away and escaped. The second prisoner was led forward, and he'd learned from the strategy of the first one. The officer shouted, ready, aim, and the prisoner shouted out, tornado! And everyone ran around confused, looking for the tornado, meanwhile the prisoner escaped. And then the third prisoner was lined up against the wall and he thought, this is easy. I know exactly what my strategy is going to be. All I need is another disaster. So the officer shouted out to the firing party, ready, aim. And the prisoner shouted out, fire. <laughs> well, we all need a good strategy, not a bad one like the prisoner in our story. And some of you may know that I teach strategy at a university down in London, and I could give you many highfalutin definitions of strategy, but let me give you the easiest definition of strategy I know, one that all of us can grasp and understand, and it consists of three simple questions. Where are we now? Where are we going? And how do we get there? Where are we now? Where are we going? And how do we get there? Now, in our passage in John chapter 12, we see the strategy that Jesus is going to follow as he looks to the future. And we're going to use these three headings as our headings today. So to begin with, let's take a look at our first question, where are we now? Now, in our narrative in John's Gospel, we've come to the famous scene, as we know, which we celebrate on Palm Sunday, where Jesus comes in to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Verse 12 tells us a great crowd had gathered for the festival. Josephus, a famous writer from these times, describes one Passover when 2,700,000 people attended. And even if these numbers are inflated, it would certainly have been a great crowd. Now let's look at how the crowd reacts to Jesus as he rides in. Firstly, they bring palm branches, and in those days, Palm branches were seen as a national symbol. Roman coins often had the figure of a palm on them to celebrate victory. Palm branches were often waved to celebrate great occasions, great successes. In the past, when a leader called Simon of Maccabee uh, rescued Jerusalem from the Syrians, he was greeted with the waving of palm branches. Secondly, in verse 13, the crowd shouts out, Hosanna, we've just been singing about it earlier. Great term of acclamation and praise. And also in verse 13, they quote, as we saw, Psalm 118, and they greet Jesus with a well-known blessing for those who come to the Passover. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they also declare him as the King of Israel. 
So let's note in passing that everything that's happening here is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. We see this in verse 15, a quote from Zechariah. Your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Even the disciples didn't realize this at the time. Verse 16 tells us, at first the disciples didn't understand. Only later did it become clear to them. So clearly all these events, they're not accidental. They've been foretold from old. But what is clear is that the crowd realize this is a moment of great significance and they greatly admire Jesus as somebody very special. So much so, we see that everyone wants to meet Jesus. Verse 18 tells us, many people went out to meet him. And in verses 20 to 21, a group of Greeks specifically asked the disciples if they can meet with Jesus. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Jesus is famous, he's special, everyone wants to meet him. In fact, he's developed such a reputation that in verse 19, even the Pharisees say, look how the whole world has gone after him. Now, what can we learn from this? Well, it's a wonderful thing to admire Jesus and to welcome him as our king. When I'm teaching leadership at the university, I often ask my students which famous person they're most impressed with and what leadership characteristics about them they most admire. And they come up with many names, Nelson Mandela, Barack Obama, Mother Teresa, and so on. But occasionally, one or two of my students mention Jesus as the person they most admire. And I suspect that some of them have come to know Jesus in a personal way for themselves. And this kind of admiration has been true throughout history. The writer Dostoevsky once wrote this. I believe there's no one lovelier, deeper, more sympathetic and more perfect than Jesus. I say to myself that not only is there no one like him, there could never be anyone else like him. And it's a great start, isn't it, to admire Jesus and to desire to meet with him as the Greeks want to do in our passage. And there may be some of you here today who've been learning more about Jesus, you've developed an admiration for him, and you'd like to encounter him for yourself. And of course, the great news is it's still a possibility today, just as it was 2,000 years ago in our passage. You come to know him for yourself. And if that's of interest to you today, something you'd like to do, please do feel free to chat to Edward or other members of the clergy team or to myself, and we'd be glad to guide you and to help to make that possible. So that is a great start to admire and get to know Jesus, but as we're going to see, it's important to delve deeper and understand more of his strategy and why he has come. We're going to see that we need more than to admire him as a great teacher and as a great role model, although of course he is all those things. What we need is a deeper understanding of his mission and what it might mean for us. So as we think about our questions on strategy, we know where we are now. Jesus is admired by the crowd as a king. Perhaps in our terms today, he's seen as a great celebrity. But we need to move on to our second question, where are we going? Or perhaps more specifically, where is Jesus going in terms of his strategy for the future? Now, when we think about this question, it's good to think about the long-term strategy. What are the ultimate aims of the mission that Jesus has come to fulfill? We see a major element of this strategy in verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. A little later in verse 32, Jesus explains this further and alludes to being lifted up. In fact, John has already used this concept of being lifted up in his gospel in chapter 3, verse 14, and in chapter 8, verse 28. And here he focuses on it again. But what does it mean to be lifted up? In fact, we see in verse 34, the crowd want to know the answer to this as well. They say, how can you say the man of, son of man must be lifted up? So what does it mean? Well, in a sense, there are three meanings here. Of course, at one level, maybe primary level, Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross, the first part of the Easter message. But secondly, he's going to be lifted up through the resurrection into glory. 
It's the great Easter message that Jesus will be raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God in heaven. But thirdly, we see that Jesus will be lifted up as the world comes to an end and the whole plan of salvation reaches its ultimate and dramatic conclusion. And this final aspect of the long-term strategy of Jesus comes out clearly in the next few verses. Verse 31, as Jesus is glorified, there will be judgment on this world. Verse 31 again, as Jesus is glorified, the prince of this world, Satan, will be driven out. Verse 32, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. These are the ultimate aims of the strategy. Let's list them again. The judgment of the world, the destruction of Satan, the drawing of men and women from the ends of the earth into heaven, and the lifting up of Jesus as the Son of Man into glory. And in one sense, all of these were achieved through the cross and the resurrection. In another sense, their fullest manifestation will be achieved ultimately as the world comes to a close one day. It's a mind-bending strategy And it's unlike any other strategy the world has ever seen. You know, most strategies in organizations today seem very small in comparison. An organization's aims might be to make more profit, to gain more market share, to serve their customers and so on. They're all worthy aims, but they all pale into insignificance in the light of these vast apocalyptic aims of biblical strategy. So to summarize our passage so far, we've got some idea of where we are now in the life and times of Jesus. We have some idea of where he's going for the future. And now let's turn to our third question when it comes to strategy, how do we get there? Now if you ask a chief executive of a major company, what is your major strategy for the future? You might get many answers to that question. But an answer you certainly wouldn't get is this, to die. And yet this is the shocking answer that Jesus gives us here. How will he get to being lifted up and draw all men and women to himself? How will he get to judge the world and destroy the prince of this world, Satan? He has to die. It's hard for us today, isn't it, I think, who are so used to the Easter message, to see this part of the strategy as it really is, a total shock and surprise. The only way for Jesus to be lifted up is for him to be sent down to the grave. And Jesus uses a powerful analogy to make this point in verse 24. I tell you the truth, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. If it dies, it produces many seeds. A couple of years ago, we planted a variety of new bulbs in our garden. And all winter they stayed in the ground, seemingly dead, We wondered whether we'd see any new life in the springtime. But of course, when spring came, they all came up and they appeared like magic. All kinds of new life appearing to make the garden look fabulous. And that's the analogy here. First death and then glorious new life. It's very easy to take this for granted today as we approach Easter, as we look at the life and death of Jesus. Let's note that for him... It was a very challenging and a very dreadful strategy. Verse 27, look at how he views it. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. It's a frightening approach to strategy, but it's one that Jesus must face if he's to be lifted up in glory. Martin Luther once said this, if you want to understand the Christian faith, you have to start with the wounds of Christ. You see, the route to being lifted up in glory is firstly to be sent down to the grave. Someone once expressed the curious paradox of the cross in this way. The cross is a picture of violence, yet the key to peace. The cross is a picture of suffering, yet the key to healing. The cross is a picture of death, but the key to life. The cross is a picture of weakness, yet the key to power. The cross is a picture of punishment, yet the key to mercy. The cross is a picture of hatred, 
yet the key to love. Well, hopefully we've managed to answer many of the key strategy questions. Where are we now? Where are we going? And how do we get there? But before we close, let's consider this so what question. How can we apply this to our lives today? What does this great strategy from the life and times of Jesus the Messiah mean for us as we approach this Easter time? Well, the passage gives us some important clues. Firstly, verse 25, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. That's a very strange thing to say. We need to hate our life in this world. What on earth can Jesus mean by that? Well, firstly, we need to realize Jesus often states things very strongly to make a point. Ultimately, he's using a shock statement to pose a very challenging question. Which world are we living for? For this world or for the world to come? Now, of course, in so many ways, this world is a remarkable place and our lives here are an amazing opportunity. As Louis Armstrong once put it, it is a wonderful world. But at another level, we know this world is a sad and broken place not as the world is truly meant to be. Francis Schaeffer, a well-known Christian writer, described the world that we live in now as a glorious ruin. And I think that sums it up so well. We watch the news week by week. We're saddened at so much suffering and pain and hopelessness. And at the heart of this, of course, lies the problem of our human hearts. As somebody once said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. It's our sin and our failure that lies at the heart of it. And not only is this world a sad and broken place, our lives in this world are short. A hundred years if we're doing really well. And so Jesus is effectively saying, live for a better world. Live for the world to come. And I wonder today, ultimately, which world do you live for? This one or for the world to come? Both are good, of course they are, but the one to come is far better. In many ways, this world is but a practice for the one to come. I wonder if you ever think to yourself, I wish I could go back and live my life again and make a better job of it. Well, the great news is we can. Ultimately, just as Jesus looked forward to being lifted up in glory, we too can look forward to that day when we too will be lifted up to a new life in the kingdom where he is king. Now secondly, as we think about application, living for the world to come means dying to ourselves and to our own desires in this world right now. Just like that seed which dies in the ground and one day bursts into fruitfulness, we too are called to die to ourselves and follow Christ as we live for the life to come. And how do we do that? Verse 26, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. We're called to a life of service. And I wonder what that means for you and I this week. What does serving Christ mean for you? What might giving to our partners mean this week? What does serving our children mean? or indeed our parents mean this week? How about serving our work colleagues or maybe our customers? Let me give you a challenge for this week ahead, not to pressure you, but to encourage you. Why not try to find two ways to serve Christ and serve others in your life in a new and special way? And at the end of the week, look back and see how you got on. Try it, pray about it. Who knows what opportunities God might bring? But we need to remember, sometimes service is costly. It may mean dying to ourselves. We may sometimes resent our service and wish we could have more time to ourselves. Service means living for Christ, living for others, and living for the life to come. Sometimes it's a challenge, but it's also, of course, an amazing privilege as well. Well, let's draw to a close. We're very close to Easter, 
And so may God help us as we come up to this special time of the year to marvel again at the great apocalyptic strategy of Jesus. He's been lifted up through the cross. He's been lifted up at the resurrection. And ultimately, he will be seen to be lifted up at the very end of time when all things come to a final conclusion. And so may we respond by living for the world to come and by giving our lives afresh in his service as we focus our eyes on an exciting future ahead. Amen. Thank you so much, John. It's been really helpful to think through Jesus' strategy. How is he going to uh, bring all people to himself? Uh, He's going to lay down his life. And we're going to respond now in song. We're going to sing a song that focuses on all that Jesus did for us on the cross. It's called Man of Sorrows. Shall we stand and sing together? Okay. 
In God the Father. I believe in God the, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together, Rob. We read some of Psalm 118 earlier to join with the crowd welcoming Jesus to Jerusalem. Today I'm going to use verses from that psalm to guide our prayers. Let us pray. The psalm opens... Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Thank you, Lord, that you are indeed good beyond anything that we can imagine. Thank you for your creation that we can enjoy. And thank you that it has a purpose which we cannot change or prevent, heading to a greater and better replacement, as we heard from John. As we draw close to Easter, we thank you again that in your wisdom, you achieved both justice and mercy, by your son taking the sentence in our place. As our world seems unable to differentiate justice and retribution, and where mercy is all too often absent entirely, may we be willing and able to show them your way of reconciliation. Amen. Later the psalmist continues, When hard pressed I cried to the Lord, he brought me into a spacious place. As we look around the world, we see many who are very hard-pressed indeed. We think of the plight of those in Gaza, trapped and starving in a tiny place in Rafa, and pray that the calls for a humanitarian ceasefire would be heeded 
so that food and medicine can reach those who desperately need it. We pray for those in Israel fearing for loved ones still held hostage and for those in Ukraine hard-pressed and seeing no hope of respite with Putin's re-election. May they know that you hear their cries and may they come to you and in time to that good and spacious place of rest that all your followers will see. The psalmist also says that his enemies swarmed around him like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. We pray for Haiti, that the gangs who have taken over will be controlled and defeated that swiftly, and that the country and its people will not then be forgotten, but helped to, be, to rebuild from the chaos of the last week. In Jesus' name, amen. The psalmist continues, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. We know this speaks of Jesus and the events of Easter. As we draw near to Easter, we pray for the events in this church over this coming week. We pray that through them, we and many in Chesham would see your son, the cross and the empty tomb as truly marvellous and would be moved to rejoice and be glad as we are called to in the psalm. We pray for the children at the Easter experience that they would see the joy of knowing your son and the forgiveness he brings. We pray for the leaders that they would quickly connect with their groups and would be blessed and strengthened themselves in their faith. Pray for the new events this year, the Maundy Thursday meal and the Easter praise and ask that they will be blessings to those who come and will help them to marvel afresh at the wonder of your salvation. Pray also for the Good Friday a meditation in church. That will again bless many people in many different ways. In Jesus' name, amen. And the crowd called out that verse, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We thank you for those who have come to us in the name of the Lord, thinking of our own varied journeys to faith and in faith. We think too of our mission partners who come to so many, but in so many different ways, but all in the name of the Lord. Lord, bless them. May they see you more and more at work. May they be able to say, the Lord's hand has done mighty things. I will proclaim what the Lord has done. We think today of the Eastwoods working in Taiwan. Thank you for David's long service as field director there. And may you guide his preparations as he looks to step down in the next year or so. Please raise up the right replacement that your work among the poor and outcast there may continue and be ever more fruitful. We pray too for their daughter Naomi's wedding this month. May it be a joyous occasion and may Josh and Naomi build a family home that shows your relationship with us in their relationship with each other. Amen. Finally, the psalmist says, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defence. He has become my salvation. We pray for those in our church or close to us who feel pushed to the brink at the moment. We pray that the Lord will help them and that they will also be able to say, he is my strength and my song. May we be God's helpers to those who need that care and compassion around us, being willing to sacrifice for their service. We pray especially today for Sue Morrill, who has been in hospital this week and is recovering in Olympic Lodge, and also for Marion Dispain, now back in hospital, praying that they will both know your presence. We pray for George Thackeray, recovering at home after surgery this week and praying for a good ongoing recovery. We continue to pray for Catherine Bett for a reduction in her back pain, and give thanks that James Alcock is now feeling a little better and pray that he will make a full recovery from his fall. And we take a moment now to pray for others known to us in need of comfort and healing at this time, including John Leach, Betty Norwood, Pamela Clements, Eddie Brown, Ray Monk and Tris Story. We lift all of these people to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And let us conclude our prayers with the Lord's Prayer, which will be on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Some bands of marriage to read between Robert Matthews and Jacqueline Harriman of this parish. This is the first time of asking if any of you knows a reason or why these two may not marry, then you are to declare it. And can I just welcome you both uh, here today? And uh, we are delighted to have you. I think it's up in Bellingdon, isn't it? It's sort of that way. Um, but because Bellingdon is a chapel of ease, they cannot have their bands read there, so they have bands read here at St. Mary's. So welcome to you. Let me just pray for you. Lord, we thank you that uh, Robert and Jacqueline could be with us this morning, and we pray that you would uh, prepare them for their wedding day. May it be full of joy and full of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Then a couple of uh, things in terms of church family news that have just happened, so a bit of feedback. We had our quiz last night for uh, our youth mission trip to South Africa, raising some funds for uh, the project out there. And I gather, John tells me that raised £2,200 last night, which is great. And it was a wonderful quiz. There were lots of different teams. And, I, and there was some friendly rivalry, but I'm glad to say that St. Mary's came out top. So, yes, <laughs> what, what can one say? <laughs> but it was great fun. And Alison, uh, you've also been raising funds for this trip by doing a parachute jump. Just tell us how you got on jumping out of an airplane at whatever, how many thousand feet? Um, I think it was 30. 13,000? Yep, 13,000. Peter's the one who remembers it more than me. Um, how did I get on? Well, let's say some people really enjoy it. I was not one of those. <laughs> I felt very, very nauseous all the way down. <laughs> so, well, so you won't be doing, doing it possibly again. Was that once in a lifetime, you think? Probably, and actually, the company I jumped with, I don't think they'd have me again if I was. <laughs> Well, well done, well done. And uh, I know a lot of people sponsored you for that. Yeah. And um, anything we can help with that or anything you want to say about that? Um, if you have sponsored me, can you pay up if you haven't? Um, if you didn't sponsor me, but you would have liked to, I, uh, they, um, I assume we're having it at the end of this service. I'm looking for John if he's around. There was a board where you could just give donations to support the young people's trip to Mansville. So if you didn't support me, but would have liked to, Please support them. <laughs> Fantastic. I think there'll be a board outside the back of church at the end. But well done. You were very brave. Well done. So... Very impressive. And you can uh, take notes if you're tempted to do the same thing from Alison. Uh, we begin. We're going to Holy Week now. What's, what's lining up? Uh, Peter, have we got Bible and beer tomorrow night? Bible and beer for busy blokes for tomorrow night. So if you'd like to come to that, you'll be very welcome. If it's uh, sort of a monthly group uh, and it, we sort of look back at uh, what's been going on on Sundays, but uh, for those who are too busy to be involved in our weekly small groups, which are also, we have spaces if you'd like to be part of a small group as well, uh, have a word with uh, Phil after the service. And then going through the week, we've got... Uh, a few things going on as usual. We've got our Wednesday worship at 8.30, followed by a toddlers. And then on Thursday evening, we've got our Monday Thursday fellowship meal. Thank you for those of you who signed up wanting to come. There's still time if you'd like to, to come to that, to sign up. It'd be really helpful if you could do that over the next uh, a day uh, or Monday. That would be really helpful so we can cater for everyone. And if you do sign up and offer to bring something, there's going to be an email coming out over the next couple of days, which will uh, tell you uh, how, how and when to bring things on Thursday. So uh, we're looking forward to that at 7 o'clock in the church rooms. And then on Friday, we've got our kids' experience in the morning. And you can sign up for that as well online. A number of children are coming to that. And that should be great fun. I think John Goodman's got a good team together for that. And then the afternoon from 12 till 3, we've got the Good Friday Parish service. Uh, it is finished is the theme. We're going through John's Gospel, as we've been doing it on a Sunday morning. 
and that wonderful final words of Jesus on the cross, it is finished. So we'll be ending there. And three hours, marking the three hours that Jesus was on the cross. So you can join. They're they're in sort of half-hour slots, so you can come for the whole three hours, or you can come and join in as as you wish. And then uh, Easter Day, just a reminder that we've got our regular 11 a.m. all-age communion will be. And then there's also an additional Easter praise at 6 o'clock, a wonderful sort of just spending some time praising the risen Christ together. So that's all that lies ahead in our Holy Week. After the service, please do stay and chat with others. Do stay for tea and coffee that will be available. Well, that's everything in terms of uh, church news. But as we go out, it's it's interesting, isn't it, how how John tells us that, uh, well, Jesus was telling us in John chapter 12, how how he is drawing us to himself through him being lifted up on the cross. So I do pray this Holy Week we would um, think this is a time to focus on Jesus in the midst of our busy lives and to put him first and reflect more deeply on all that he went through for us in order to to save us so we could be uh, right with God now but also the hope of heaven in the future. We were lost, but through Jesus we are found. And that's our theme of our last song. When I was lost, you came and rescued me. Let's stand and celebrate together.
Please be seated for a final prayer. A closing prayer for Palm Sunday. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the mind to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. And may the blessing of God the Father and the, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us and deepen our walk with him this holy week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Thanks.